Las Vegas, a beacon of light, sound, and dry heat, a popular tourist destination, a haven built for gamblers, thrill seekers, and those who wish to capitalize on those first two groups. Vegas has always attracted the money makers and takers, and they've made it a contest amongst themselves to see who can build the most gaudy nightmares imaginable. Enter Sphere. Created by the Madison Square Garden Company, built over the course of five years through inflation, setbacks, and global plagues, finally opening to the public in the fall of 2023. It now stands as a giant eyeball, sometimes literally, protruding from the Nevada desert. When the public was finally granted access to its vitreous cavity, it was home to a short film from Darren Aronofsky and a U2 residency, which was replaced by a Dead & Company residency, and currently, an Eagles residency. You can check out any time you like, and you'll probably leave soon because there isn't much else to do there. Sphere is a classic case of a stadium that needed a show instead of a show that needed a stadium. Essentially, it was a venue that was built because the prospect of something amazing going there eventually was more enticing than an existing show requiring something of its caliber to be built in the first place. Who cares if we don't have a plan for it? It's the Vegas Strip. People will go to it because it's there. Famously, Nothing to do in Vegas, an already well-documented tribute to excess. Vegas claims to be an entertainment mecca, but that to me is a ridiculous notion. There aren't any haunted house hotels, it's not run by a man with no pants, and you can't even race chocobos there. Wait, chocobos? What does that have to do with anything? Hi everyone! Let's get this party started! How is it you all know the words? Did you rehearse? Yeah, every Thursday. Oh, I get it. Talk about a real-world thing, compare it tangentially to the topic at hand, rinse, wash, rehydrate. Ah, it's the Chris the Nerd way. And if you enjoy the Chris the Nerd way, consider subscribing. We recently hit 900 subs, and we're on the way to 1,000. Don't fuck this up for me. I'm just kidding. The, subscribe, though. I mean, do what you want, but subscribe. No judgment, but judgment. Subscribe. Become a statistic. Love you. Okay, so I suppose we should actually talk about what the title of the video says I'm going to talk about. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is a 2024 RPG released for the PlayStation 5. It is both a remake and an expansion of the middle third of 1997's Final Fantasy VII, a game that made the absolute error of being one of the most influential RPGs to be released in the late 90s. Veni, Veni, Venios, pop culture's been forever altered, Sephiroth. Throughout the entirety of my playthrough of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, I was asking myself this question. Is it a show that needed a stadium, or a stadium that needed a show? Did the quality of the product delivered justify the massive world that was built for it? And I still found myself asking this question after the credits had rolled, so I decided to go back and replay the original. It's still good, by the way. I don't know, you might have been wondering. You could have been. I mean, it is an older game. You might have woken up one day in a panic thinking, Fuck! Is the original Final Fantasy VII still good? So much life has happened in such a short span of time, I just don't know anymore. Well, fret not. The original Final Fantasy VII still holds up quite well. It's a good RPG with really good story, fantastic characters, and good combat. Also, newer versions of the game have a god mode that automatically refills your HP, MP, and limit gauge. And don't tell me that I've lessened the experience and need to get good. I did get good. I pressed in the thumbstick and the game made me good in a matter of seconds. A+. FromSoft should consider adding this feature to their games to piss off the worst people on the planet just below fascists and couponers. Now, obviously, an extensive remake of Final Fantasy Siete with modern gaming sensibilities is a show that needs a stadium, right? I mean, we are talking about one of the most celebrated RPGs ever. The act of doing it at all makes it worth it. Spared no expense and all that. You need to build the right stadium to accommodate such an ambitious project. Sure, newer ports of the game can make quality of life improvements, but if you really want to go all out, increased scale, size, scope, polygons. We can have every grain of sand and coastal soul rendered alongside every strand of hair on Cloud's Mako-infused head. No more rough facsimiles with these Roblox-looking anime boys and girls. Ooh. 
I need the extravagantly animated angst. And we got that in a little game called Final Fantasy VII Remake, a game that covered the first third of the original game, from the destruction of the Mako reactor to the party's escape from Shinra headquarters in Midgar. And honestly, they did a great job with it. Yes, a couple of videos ago I was complaining about how I barely remembered anything from Remake, even though I'd already played it once before because it was so big and overwhelming, but I, I'm gonna need you to just ignore that for a second. I still came out of that playthrough feeling positive because the story's so well paced. It had a good ratio of story missions to side missions. I liked that the characters from the introduction are expanded upon. Avalanche is better characterized, and even if it was densely populated, Midgar and the slums beneath it felt like a real world. Details were intricately paced and placed to make sure Cloud had weight and presence within them. He interacts with most objects and people in his environment, and that goes a long way toward immersing players. Sure, he may have been a minuscule piece when standing next to the immensity of Shinra headquarters or any of the Mako reactors, but even small pieces can have great effect on the planet as a whole. And if that design philosophy holds true through the rest of the remake trilogy, we'll be gold saucer, baby. Is there anything at all that might put a dent in those plans? Well, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth covers a lot of ground, quite literally, from the group stay in Calm all the way to the Temple of the Ancients, the part of Final Fantasy VII that went open world. Of course, when I say that, I mean as open world as the original PlayStation would allow for. When compared to the games of today, it's essentially the size of a walk-in closet. But if there's one thing I can say that I learned in my recent playthrough of the original game, it's that Final Fantasy VII is very efficient. Brilliant. What a quote. Use that as the box blurb. 27 years after release. Truly every molecule of space in the original game was utilized. Square wanted to stuff as much stuff as they could across multiple discs. Anywhere you could go to on the map, there was something. As long as you had the legs, wheels, or propellers to go somewhere, you could go there. And at the end of those winding roads was either a person to talk to, an item to find, an enemy to fight, a secret to uncover, or an undead vampire man to simp over. This is the skin of a killer bill. The land between all of these areas was used as the grind pits, forests, fields, and rivers full of monsters. Return them to the planet in exchange for their delicious experience points. Level up your party, materia, and limit breaks. Ooh, now might be a good time to use great gospel, honey. But now? Oh, it's current year, baby. How is Rebirth going to handle the open world concept? Modern games require modern open worlds. We're not all about grinding anymore. Now it's about scale and scope. Stretch out that draw distance and draw in every bit of processing power you can, like you're pulling scans from a beetle. Oh wait, drawing, that's, that's something else, isn't it? Yeah, can't wait for the three-part modern remake of this bungler. The locations that you remember from the original game are fully realized in incredible detail, from the parade-filled streets of Junon, to the rocky cliff faces of Cosmo Canyon, to the suspicious coziness of Nibelheim. It's great to see all of these familiar areas adapted with such care and attention, but what I'm interested in are the massive swaths of land that separate all of them. Just like the real world. My favorite part of reality is just how far away everything is. But much like a road trip on Route 95 through North Carolina, it doesn't matter if danger lurks behind every billboard that tells you hell's flames are licking your toes. What matters is that at least the fields are a verdant green. The vistas in Rebirth are quite impressive. From the moment you leave the city of calm, the grasslands sprawl out before you in a sea of green, and the beautiful colors of the ocean splash against the rocks of the coast. It it is stunning. I'm not sure I'll ever lose my wonder for visually impressive worlds like this, but it is a video game after all. You can create all of the digital square mileage that you want, you have to have interesting things to put in it. And like I said, the original game used its open world areas for grinding, and that's easy to do when your combat is initiated by random encounter. But now we can render all of the enemies in the overworld in real time. You can pepper the land with them, but they can't take up every inch of it. So what else are we going to put in this big old biome? Fun secrets? Cool items? Stories that players will be excited to find? How about towers? The Ubisoft sandbox has dominated the gaming... landscape... <laughs> for years now. 
So why can't Final Fantasy climb a tower to unlock icons in a small radius? Icons that equate to pointless busy work. Fight an enemy, but with caveats. Fight an enemy, but with strength. Press the A button to make your summon slightly better. Side quests for random rubes that need three out of three glowing rocks in order to put a, a green check mark next to their gormless heads. Now, as somebody who likes rocks, I'm actually out here on a rock hunt already. I have to ask, why am I collecting rocks? Well, I know the answer. It's for the low effort survival crafting system. Combine stick and leaf, get sword, combine dust and dreams, get health potion, craft a whole bunch of stuff to unlock a whole bunch of other stuff to craft. My question when it comes to any crafting system in a game is a quite simple one. Is there any reason to do it outside of just buying the items you need with money in shops or in a vending machine? And the answer is often no. Video game economies are stupidly easy to exploit, just like real world economies. Bet on them to crash. You'll eventually be right, you'll make a ton of dirty money, and then you can start the next Kennedy dynasty. For legal reasons, that is a joke. And also, not financial advice. Real worlds using fake money infuriates me. But the economy in Rebirth is easy to manipulate. You'll obtain plenty of gil just from existing, and the items that you can buy are only marginally worse than the ones you can craft, which themselves are only marginally worse than the ones you can find in chests scattered about the world. The crafting system is amazingly pointless, and toward the latter half of the game, I would recommend ignoring it entirely. If completing the story for you is contingent on plus five speed to Yuffie's boots, then maybe we should start considering that this may be a skill issue. So you've got towers that lead to busy work and a crafting system that's a complete waste of time. Do we perhaps have a third thing that we could add to maybe make this open world a little more worthwhile? Perhaps a bloated and obtrusive card game that only gets fun if you're willing to dedicate tons of hours to finding the cards that make it worth playing? Hmm, well, I say we table that. It's not an immediate no, but I did vomit in my mouth a little bit. Maybe we should just explore. You see the sights. I mean, if I'm gonna be pressing forward on the thumbstick for over 40 hours, is it at least enjoyable? Yeah, well, you remember how I said one of the best parts of Remake was that Cloud had presence and interacted with his world? And that's easy to do when everything is densely populated, placed with intent, and mostly linear. Cloud moves people out of his way. His interactions with his environment feel natural. Not so much the case here. The physics engine struggles mightily to interact with terrain. It, it tries. As Cloud runs around, he will effortlessly bound up tall rock faces, but two foot high fences are nigh impregnable because the system struggles to differentiate between what Cloud should be able to interact with and what he actually can interact with. Which has led me to conclude that this game is a stadium that needed a show. Square built a visually impressive world to house an incomplete story, and no matter how you slice it, you are going to be spending over 40 hours to not get a complete resolution. Obviously, you know that if you're familiar with the story of the original game, but this one doesn't even end satisfyingly. Yes, you fight Sephiroth, you fight the Turks, who are tired of answering those questions about Istanbul, and you fight Rufa Shinra. And this is prima facie fine. They're the antagonists, but it feels like we're just checking off items on a list. We fought them in Remake, we fought them here, and we're gonna fight them again in the next game. Nothing changes at all as a result of a fight. Oh, we're all in the same location, better push up my shades and raise my dukes to try and punch the sad anime boy with the 40 pound baking sheet that's been fashioned into a sword. Final Fantasy VII Remake was an expansion, but it was still a tightly told story. It had a satisfying enough conclusion that would tide people over for the four years they would have to wait for a sequel. Rebirth, on the other hand, feels bloated. It was a perfectly capable soldier, and then Hojo came in and added some Genova cells, and maybe a few of his own, a little freak. And what results is a game that is certainly big, it'll take a while to drain its health bar completely, but at a certain point you realize it just doesn't have any respect for your time. At the onset of my playthrough, I was gonna do everything. I spent 10 hours finding and doing every little quest in the grasslands, the first major open world area of the game. And after all that time I realized, oh wow, I'm really bored. Finding these towers and beating these enemies with these idiotic parameters isn't fun. I'm not having fun. I want to experience the story, which is the part I know is fun. And once I started ignoring all the busy work, cards, and bullshit, my experience improved exponentially. 
and if the best way that I can recommend playing a game is to ignore a massive chunk of it, well, that's not good. I mean, it's like Vegas. I can recommend a lot of things for someone to do there, but am I going to recommend that you go wander the nearby desert looking for sticks and rocks? For the inevitable conclusion to the Final Fantasy VII Remake trilogy, we're going to be covering the finale of the original game. Duh. We still have plenty of ground to cover. I can't wait to go snowboarding right as Meteor is about to hit. I didn't cover the story too much in this video, but I can say it's not a tale that I'm jealous of having to finish. And whatever this next game is called, Final Fantasy VII Retread would be my suggestion, they've got a tough road ahead of them. Not me, though. Once I finish with this video, I won't have to think about Final Fantasy VII again until the final game of the remake trilogy comes out. Or, not exactly. I am planning a trip to Sphere in Vegas, because I think it might actually be the Black Materia, and I, I need to go save the world. The planet's dying, Cloud. Shinra Electric Company hired Darren Aronofsky to create an ecological short film in one of the most environmentally unfriendly-looking buildings I've ever seen. Sephiroth's gonna use it to summon Meteor. Thank you so much for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, be sure to fulfill the whims of the algorithm with likes, comments, and a subscription to the channel. If you want to support my struggle, there's perks over on Patreon. Support me if you can, love me if you must, and have a great rest of your day.